Hello, I want to talk about the fracture land hypothesis, and this is joint work with Marco Yama at George Mason University, Yu Hong Lin and Guangdong University of Foreign Studies, and Tuan Kyu Sen at National University of Singapore. If you look at a map of China and Europe, you will soon realize that over the last two millennia, China has been most of the time controlled by just one state or perhaps by a handful of them. In comparison, Europe has been fragmented among dozens and dozens of states. Why is this the case? Why do we have such a different comparative political structure between the two extremes of Eurasia? And why do we care about the origins of comparative political fragmentation? The main reason is because there is an old argument that goes back at the very least to Jones in 1981, and it has been revived by Mokir in 2016 and Scheidel in 2019, that highlights that the economic rise of Western Europe can be attributed to its polycentric and competitive state system. Conversely, Many explanations of China's comparative failure focus on its long history as a centralized empire. Therefore, thinking about the factors that account for the prevalence of political fragmentation in Europe and the prominence of political centralization in China might teach us much about the origins of economic growth. But even if you don't embrace the idea that a polycentric state system was behind the great divergence between Europe and China, Political unification is such a salient observation about the state structure that we want to have a good understanding of why it occurs. A classical answer, which at the very least goes back to David Hume, and it was eloquently argued by Jared Diamond in the 1990s, is the hypothesis of the fracture land. In particular, that because of the mountain barriers, dense forest, and rugged terrain that exist all across Europe, the construction of large empires in that continent has been much harder than the construction of continents in other parts of Eurasia. This hypothesis, however, has come uh, to receive many criticisms over the last decade and a half. Hoffman, for instance, has pointed out that China is in fact more mountainous than Europe, an argument also highlighted by Turkey and Greer. And in fact, if we look at a map of Europe and a map of China, and in these maps the dark colors represent areas that are mountainous, you will very easily see that China has many more mountainous areas than Europe. Other researchers, such as Hui in 2005, have criticized the fracture land idea for being very static and for confusing what is perhaps just a contingent outcome with a necessary outcome. However, if you think about both the arguments in favor and against the fracture land, you very soon realize that all these arguments are mainly verbal and that they don't offer much more that indirect quantitative assessment. In this paper, we want to assess the fracture land hypothesis more carefully. To do so, we are going to build a dynamic spatial model of state formation, and we are going to match it to very rich geographical and agricultural productivity data. More concretely, we do as follows. We take Eurasia, and by that we mean the areas that comprises Western Europe, and here in green we have all the areas to the west of the Hachland line, which is usually considered culturally Western Europe, North Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and here in red, what we have is China proper, the core of the Chinese imperial states. We exclude the north of Siberia, the very north of Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa, Oceania, and the Americas. Why do we pick this area? Because we want to think about the state formation between the dawn of the Iron Age, that starts around 1000 before the current era to around the start of the age of exploration, 1450 to 1500 of the current era. During those centuries, Eurasia was an area that was in contact with trade and military conquest and was relatively isolated from all the other areas that we have excluded from our investigation. Once we take this area, we are going to divide it in around 28,000 hexagons. 
y and hexagon because it's a regular tiling of the Euclidean map, which has a lot of inherent advantages. Its hexagon will have a length of 28 kilometers. That's the distance that an adult person can walk in a day. And we can, and we can think about an hexagon of 28 kilometers as roughly the area that a very basic polity at the dawn of the Iron Age can control. More concretely, we will assume that around 1000 before the current era, its hexagon is an independent polity. Moreover, we are going to give its hexagon information about geographical features, such as how rugged the terrain is, presence of rivers, of seas, of mountains, of forest, some information about the climate, and also information about the land productivity in each of the hexagons. Then you can think, for instance, about hexagon K that has six neighbors. And this is the very first period of our simulation where each of these six neighbors is a different polity and the hexagon itself is a polity. What we are going to have is conflicts with some probability and in that way we capture the idea that conflict is a random phenomena, K is going to get into a war, for instance, with one, or K is going to get into a conflict with two. And I will explain in a second what determines those conflicts. If K wins against two, K will annex two. If two wins, two will annex K. In addition, we will also have some secession. So let me give you a particular example. Imagine that after a few periods, what we have now is a polity K that controls six hexagons and a polity K hat that controls three hexagons. With some probability, those two polities will go to war. What determines the probability of war is going to be determined by the relative productivity of the land in each of the two states. States that are very productive are very attractive conquest possibilities. States that are less productive are less attractive conquest possibilities. There is going to be a conflict, and that conflict will be the outcome of that conflict will be determined by the military capability of each of the two states, and this will depend on the amount of resources they can uh, put together, and it will depend on topographical characteristics. Conquering areas protected by mountains is harder than conquering areas not protected by mountains. Nevertheless, the outcome of all these conflicts will be stochastic. And in that way, we again capture the idea that we have contingency in human affairs. If K wins, K will incorporate K hat. If K hat wins, it will annex K. And also, as I was briefly mentioned before, K with some probability or K hat may have secession and some of the hexagons may become a different polity on its own and we think about those as interstate conflicts. What I can do now is show you a short movie of one representative simulation from our model. You can see here at the very beginning a wall that is right after a couple of simulations, after a couple of periods, where you basically can see that each polity is, each hexagon is a different polity. We start the simulation and as time passes by, we start seeing consolidation. And look at here how we very, very early start seeing consolidation around China. We also see consolidation here in what corresponds to North Ireland and North India. And we see much less consolidation going on in Europe. Let me stop the simulation now. And, you know, after a few hundred periods, what we have is a state that really looks a lot like historical China, like the core of China of the imperial dynasties. We also see a state over here that looks a lot like the northern India empires, like think about the Delhi Sultanate or later the Mughal Sultanate. And interestingly enough, these states are having problems moving to the south. In Europe, we have polities that resemble Spain. We have polities that resemble England 
Ireland, Scotland, even Morocco over here, not all the polities resemble perfectly. For instance, here in the Balkans and in the Middle East, we don't have such a great mapping with the data. Over here in Siberia, you see still a lot of dispersion. And of course, what you want to remember is that this is before 1500 and then before Russia started annexing Siberia. So at that time, Siberia and more of Central Asia is just a parcel of very small tribal polities. So why are we having this unification over here? We will explore that a little bit later in more detail, but this is going to be directly linked with the fact that we have an absence of big mountain barriers in this area of China, combined with an extremely productive agricultural land. Its simulation of our model will turn out a different outcome. To capture this idea, what we do is we run 19 different simulations and we plot in figure 5 and 6 are the probability distributions of different outcomes and as a way to summarize the information what we are plotting over here is the heat map of the Herfindahl index which is just the standard index of concentration in this case of political concentration in terms of states. Not only we see in all those distributions of probability that China unifies while Europe does not, but also that China unifies much earlier. And as we discuss in the paper in much more detail, the timing actually fits very well what we observe in the data. So then we conclude from our simulations that indeed fractured land provides a robust explanation for the political divergence observed at the two ends of Eurasia, a unified China and a fragmented Europe. Moreover, the model is extremely useful because it helps us to illustrate that there are two sufficient mechanisms at hand. The first mechanism is topography. Imagine that of all the characteristics of each hexagon, we shut down productivity of land and we focus only on the ruggedness of the terrain. The location of European mountains are going to create several geographical cores that can provide the nuclei for different European states. That's why in our simulation before, for instance, we have a unified polity in the Iberian Peninsula, which is protected by the Pyrenees from, with respect to the rest of Europe. In comparison, China was dominated by a single vast plain between the Yangtze and the Yellow River. As soon as one state dominates that big plain, it's going to be able to extend to the rest of China. But there is, and this is quite interesting, a second sufficient mechanism. That mechanism is productive land. Imagine now that we shut down topographical characteristics and we only focus on differences in agricultural productivity. And here what we are going to have is that the presence of a dominant core region of highland productivity in the North China Plain is going to generate the nucleus for a new powerful state that will dominate all China but there is going to be a lack of a similar area in Europe. Of course, the fact that we have this very high land productivity in the North China Plain is going to face its own limits. And the limits, as we saw before in the uh, simulation, will be all the plains, all the steps to the north, and then when we get to much more mountainous areas in the west and the south of China. It is only when we neutralize both the topography and the productive agricultural land that Europe and China cease to move at different paces toward political unification. So our paper concludes that fractured land is indeed a solid quantitative explanation of political fragmentation in Europe and unification in China, and it is through two different mechanisms that reinforce each other in the real world. In this short video, I'm not going to have time to explain in detail all the robustness tests that we conduct in our paper. But the quick summary of all these robustness tests is that they confirm the key role of fractured land in a broad sense, including both topography and productive land. Let me thus conclude with a quick summary of our paper. We have built a simple dynamic spatial model of a state formation. In particular, we have explicitly modeled the role of terrain in mediating conflict within and among states. And we demonstrate through our simulations 
that either topography or the location of the location of productive land can generate political unification in China and persistent political fragmentation in Europe. Finally, as an additional feature of our paper, we present a flexible methodological framework based on this dynamic spatial model of state formation to which we can add many further extensions. For instance, we could think about changes in military technology. Some military technology can be better for defense and some military technology can be better for offense. We can think about the role played by culture. Perhaps after a number of periods where a polity has been unified, it has developed a sense of an imagined community that is going to help it resist annexation by a different policy, polity. Or we can think about the role of religion. All of those will be interesting extensions that we hope to address in future papers.